At the same time that Luna was painting that painting, Ferdinand Blumenthal, buddy of Rizal, um, great linguist and scholar, was drawing this map. It's an ethnographic map, basically dividing the Philippines into three groups. He said, there are lowlanders, those of us who lived in the city, in uh, what would you call this, fuchsia. There are the highlanders, those who live in the mountains and belong to the tribes in yellow. And there are the Muslims. In this area here, linked very clearly, according to his map, with the people in Borneo. Now, there are so many ways to slice and dice this. The more modern maps would break it down, not in terms of highlanders and lowlanders and Muslims, but would break it down into the language you speak. And even that has radically changed. And that would be a whole different afternoon where so many of the things that you will hear Filipinos of a, gener of a certain generation insist that over here are the Visayans and over there are the Ilocanos has become obsolete in a manner, matter of a single generation. I was talking to one um, scholar in the University of the Philippines where he says there are whole areas of the country up here that were once Tagalog and are now essentially Ilocano, the province I come from, Aurora province is a good example of this. The Ilocano areas themselves have become depopulated because so many have gone abroad. There are whole areas of Mindanao that used to be considered Cebuano speaking and have now become in a single generation Ilongo speaking, while whole parts near uh, Bacolod and, and uh, that area now have large Cebuano-speaking populations. 10% of Cebu is Muslim. These are changes that are happening under the radar and in ways that, aside from a few dedicated scholars, no one is noticing, and yet we carry over the same assumptions and the same behavior. An example, to close this portion would be that in Manila itself, about, oh, five, six years ago, there was a big uh, hullabaloo in Green Hills over prayer areas for Muslims. And there was a big division among the village residents around the area because there were some who were against it and some who were for it. What people were ignoring in the whole thing was that it's not just a problem in Green Hills or a situation you faced in Green Hills. They were grappling with the same problem in Baguio. They are looking at the same uh, problem in Pangasinan, where we have existed for centuries with certain antipathies that we take for granted. It's in a single generation, there are now entire communities. And the question is no longer the problem down south that you read about in the papers. It is the question of coexistence all over the Philippines. And for the Moros themselves, I've had them um, express opinions that every time something flares up here, they are as angry about it now as perhaps we are, and just as frightened. Because they say, what is the relevance of a peace negotiation in this part of the world, or this part of the country, when I am a Moro in Bacchio? And whatever happens here, I will always be a Moro in Bacchio. And therefore, you cannot isolate that problem anymore. And this is something that is so new in a society where we tend to be so traditional that I don't know how long it will take for people to even realize that it's sinking in and that it requires a, such a thorough change in perspective. Even for those who come from abroad and, are, and receive these certain um, assumptions from Filipinos that they rely on for information. How relevant is that information? How true are those assumptions? Up to now, you're making decisions about trade and investments and where to set up your business based on the idea, well, it's always been quiet here and that sort of thing, but is it still? People are hardworking because they're this ethnicity there. Are they still? These are the things we should be asking ourselves. Now, as you go on, one thing is sure. We may not be very nationalistic, but we are very patriotic. 
What's the difference? It's the same way we can't seem to ever agree on what we expect or want or think of our government. But every Filipino, including the pickpockets, will be proud and wave the flag when there is a Manny Pacquiao fight. It's the same reason that we will get into huge discussions over the national anthem, but none of us will pay our taxes. If that's the sort of reality we're dealing with, this brings me to yet another map, as if you didn't have enough this morning. Now, this is a very interesting map that was published in a magazine in 1943. And it basically shows how the Americans imagined the world would be after World War II. And for them, the logical progression of things was there was going to be a consolidation. So basically, they were already thinking that there was going to be a kind of European Union, except for the British. Uh, they were looking at a greater India, which is very interesting, and that they were looking at a greater China. But there's one aspect of this map that I want to focus on. That's the Philippines. To their mind, at the end of World War II, this was going to be the Philippines. This is interesting to me because of two things. Um, in a way, it's the Philippines not very far removed from the way you could look at the organic Philippines before the West arrived, where the orientation of, of what were of the people living here really stretched to all these areas. It's even not very different from the way the Spaniards might have imagined the Philippines. It was a, a project that even the Filipinos were involved in because if you look through the sort of things that were going on among our, our government officials at the time, they were actually lobbying for this territory to be given to the Philippines at the end of World War II. And it's very interesting because, again, it shows a kind of, I don't know if you call it ambition or, um, a kind of, of uh, desire that we don't seem to have anymore. That the idea that Filipinos of a certain generation would say, yes, we should be running Borneo, and, and, and not have any angst about it, is an attitude that you could base as having evaporated with this. This is Rizal Avenue in February 1945, after the destruction of about two-thirds of Manila to an extent that we are only beginning to recover from that destruction now in the first decade of the 21st century. In terms of everything, the idea that before World War II, if some of you talked to your grandparents, we had streetcars. We had electric streetcars and we had piped in gas to homes. And this is something that is still uh, unimaginable for modern day uh, residents of Metro Manila. This national trauma, the destruction of the country, the division of those who supported the Japanese and opposed the Japanese, I think led to a situation where we lost our ambition because we just had to focus on surviving day by day. You meet many people, many families uh, that you know where only one of the whole clan survived. Yeah, all areas that you can imagine places like Dasma and Sanlo, imagine places like that where two-thirds of the residents were the professional thinking administrative classes of this country were wiped out the way people were wiped out in Ermita and Malate during World War II. And the consequences this has to the self-esteem, self-confidence, and even the capability of an entire country is something we have never quite gotten our minds around. It is still a personal tragedy for most people. And it's only with the 50th anniversary of the war that some of the survivors even told their stories for the first time. So imagine that we were going through 50 years of just living day by day, trying to rebuild, much less forgetting how to imagine leapfrogging ahead. So you have a situation where 
what we are, we are on our own. And for most people, this is what our culture is all about. This is what we sell to tourists. This is what tourists bring away. This is what your children make fun of when they go to Baguio. And if this weren't bad enough, it's this too. Right? And it is very small, very crude, very cheap. Nick Joaquin had a larger term for it, ironically, which was that it's a heritage of smallness. It's the idea that you knock these off, forgetting the results on the forests, and forgetting the fact that you have trained generation after generation of craftspeople to produce something like this when they could do so much better. But it's a quick buck, and it's a conversation piece, and it's entered the stage where it's manufactured in an assembly line, and you can buy it in Robinson's Galleria, including, since I didn't know if there were going to be kids here, the notorious penis ashtrays that you see, too. And that's what we have to show for ourselves. It's either that or the plaque showing the crisis of Moroland. It's the other thing that they sell. How do we go beyond this? How do we go beyond the fact that there is this vista we have not yet even explored? There is this reality that is increasingly harsh. There is the pedestrian items that, in the end, are all we have to show for ourselves. Brings me to this picture, which is, to my mind, one of the best examples of propaganda ever printed. I would think you know who this gentleman is. It's Jose Rizal. What does this picture tell you? What is the message of this? Uh, I suppose it's supposed to appear to be a snapshot. Try to decode this. OK, it's Rizal. He's a Filipino and a gentleman who is important. <laughs> He's from Central Casting, yes, with the you know with the dutiful wife. What's what's Rizal doing? Treating. Yeah, he's treating this gentleman. Now, you can tell it's staged because he's not really even looking at the guy's eye, as you can tell. Yeah. He's perhaps looking at the wife's bosom or, you know, but, <laughs> but nominally, the story is supposed to be, here's the great Filipino treating the white man. And Probably this, is, this was the 12th take and this guy's eyes are dried up already from having to stare. But it's a great, it's a great ambitious, self-confident story. And like so many pictures, it tells something that took us 10 minutes to discuss in just one frame. You contrast that with do we have any sort of pictures like this anymore? Do we even bother to try to tell stories like this anymore? Uh, 